Seeds not only provide us with food to eat, but they represent the future and also allow us to reflect on our history. They are heirlooms, a connection to our ancestors and their stories. And today, in Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we celebrate stories of Asian culture and connection to nature and food through seeds with Y.C. Miller from Kitazawa Seed Company. Welcome to episode 152 of Blue Mangrove Radio. Hello, plant friends. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. Oh my God, so many exciting things happening in spring for Bloom and Grow Radio. Today, we have such a special conversation with Y.C. Miller of Kitazawa Seed Company about the importance of preserving Asian seeds and stories. Kitazawa Seed Company is a seed company that specializes in offering the highest quality Asian seeds to delight the diverse palates of their customers. They offer over 500 seed varieties that produce traditional heirloom Asian vegetables popularly found in farmer's markets, specialty grocery stores, and restaurants. YC and I would love to hear your stories of your own connection to seeds on the Instagram post associated with this episode. Uh, This was such a special conversation, and I want to highlight YC and the stories of Kitazawa's customers that she shares, so let's dive right in. YC, welcome to Bloom and Grow Radio. I'm so excited to chat with you today. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm happy to be here. So before we get into the larger conversation, I would love to get to know you a little bit better. Would you want to share how you became the plant person that you are today? You know, I'm still learning. I feel like I stand on the shoulders of giants or, you know, just peer over the shoulders of giants. There are a lot of people in my life that I really have looked up to as mentors. But this really started, I, you know, I grew up in a very rural community. I used to joke around that when I was growing up, there were more cows than people in my town. And my grandmother was an avid organic gardener, kind of before organic gardening became a catchphrase. She was doing uh, organic gardening and had massive gardens and you know, that was an important part of watching her. And my father also had, you know, three large gardens. We had 50 acres of land that we grew up on. And it used to be a working farm. My father was not a farmer, but he had huge gardens. I remember a lot of my summers would be spent harvesting and packing away food for the winter. I declared at one summer that I hated peas because I was sick of shucking peas. And I sort of thought that in my child brain that if I said I didn't like them anymore, I wouldn't have to shuck them anymore. But that didn't work. I still had to shuck the peas. That's an interesting strategy. <laughs> yeah, it, it didn't it didn't work. And I'm sure you know, I kept trying to feel like maybe some child labor laws were being violated, but that didn't work either. But, you know, I did appreciate, I think, as an adult, what that kind of experience really laid um, as a foundation. Um, my father now is famous in our community for having a UPIC rhubarb patch that people come every single year to his, his rhubarb farm patch. And so now I sort of jokingly refer to him as a rhubarb farmer. But, you know, I think that just growing up in a rural place and being around a lot of farming as a farming community and then, you know, doing a lot of participating in the gardening of, you know, managing large gardens and really growing a lot of our own food led to sort of a perspective that I have on agriculture in people's lives, but also what can happen when people don't have 50 acres to grow their own food on. What does it mean to just have a patio garden? Or if you're in an urban area, I live in Oakland now, and I actually live in an apartment. I don't have 50 acres, but you can still actually do a lot to celebrate the diversity of plants and vegetables that we have available to us. And especially, I think, for communities of color, especially, a lot of those vegetables can't be found necessarily in stores. They're more available now than they had ever been. But a lot of times, our only way to actually have access to those kinds of plants and really meaningful vegetables that are very culturally important were to grow them ourselves. And I didn't grow up growing growing any you know, Korean vegetables. I came to them as an adult 
and it has played in a huge part in the way that I have reconnected with my heritage and the role that connecting with specific plants has played with reconnecting with my my food and you know my own sort of development has been massively important. Yeah, can you speak more to that reconnection with your heritage because I know that that's the mission of Kitazawa which we'll talk about a little bit more in a bit. But can you speak more to what that experience was like for you? <music> If you have the travel bug, if you dream of seeing the cities and plants of the world, I have a great podcast recommendation to add to your listening roster plan, friend. It's called Women Who Travel from Condé Nast Traveler, and it's a podcast for anyone who loves to explore places both close and far from home. Join host Lale Arikaglu, who has a particularly delightful voice and British accent, each week as she shares her 10 years of experience as an endlessly curious and passionate global journalist, as well as the story stories of self-identifying women travelers from around the globe. Though travel and adventure has historically been publicly claimed by men, Women Who Travel creates a space for anyone excited about global issues and traveling. From the depths of the Patagonian wilderness to walks through Europe's oldest cities, Women Who Travel immerses you in the travel experience featuring sound from around the world alongside guest interviews and listener-submitted audio diaries. This tableau of sound brings the inspiration and joy of this community of travelers to wherever you're listening from. Women Who Travel is available now wherever you listen to podcasts. Yeah, when I was, oh, now I, let me see, 2007, 2008, 2007, I did a heritage trip to Korea. And it was with this amazing organization based out of New York City. They've been running these trips for decades. And so um, I had the privilege of going on this trip. It was a tour of Korea of social justice organizations and a lot of the movement work that was happening in Korea. And also there was a portion of the trip that was my favorite part where we worked on a farm. And there is a long tradition in the Korean democracy movement where people, students would go out and work in factories and on farms. And this was sort of a homage to that. And so we were on a pear farm. And I think that that was maybe one of the first times when I really felt the idea of what roots really meant. And I think that it really spoke to my soul about, you know, who I am as a, as a person, what belonging really meant. And so that was, I think, the birth or the awakening of my um, sort of reconnection, not only with, you know, my heritage, but also with food and also the plants and vegetables and the agricultural practices that went along with that. And so ever since then, it's been a learning process for sure. And I, again, I'm always still learning, but it's been really joyful and, I, and it's been um, incredibly meaningful. Yeah, because I would imagine you're having this interesting experience of learning on the farm to grow the food, but you're probably also experiencing, I would imagine, some of the varieties that you had never seen in the States. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that my definition of what Korean food was, was very sort of plastic at that point. And to really see kind of the diversity of, you know, Korea is a small country, but there, it's incredibly diverse just in terms of landscape and climate and because and also just the thousands and thousands and thousands of different varieties of plants and vegetables like any like any country really and you know there is a long heritage you know korea is a peasant based society that it sort of came from the farmers and so there is this really long history and tradition and it makes me really proud to sort of be of that tradition um, and to be able to bring that kind of ethos back to the work that we do and be able to recognize that my experience isn't singular. It was very special to me, but there's, you know, similar experiences that people in the United States have with their respective relationships with reconnecting with their 
culturally significant vegetables and plants and stories that they have of people bringing seeds over from relatives and things like that. So it's been a pleasure to be able to celebrate that and to honor that and also to be able to be a source of seeds and food, really, that I think people want to be able to have access to. Yeah, it's interesting. Offline, we had talked a little bit about, I'm Italian, my family's come from Italy, and my grandma would sow seeds in her bra to bring them to the States. My grandparents were very poor, and my grandma had a second, they had two plots, a plot with a house and then a plot with a garden, and she grew almost all the food that they ate in the garden, you know, in Queens. But it's interesting what you're talking about, you know, taste, I feel like is so emotional. And I mean, you can taste something and it brings you immediately back to wherever decades previous, right? Like I can taste a sauce and remember my grandma, but in order to get that taste, we have to learn how to grow and preserve the food. And then though you have the surface experience of the taste, but it's actually when you learn to grow the food, when you learn to grow the tomato for me with tomatoes and it being Italian, learning to grow the tomato connected me to my grandma even more than learning to cook the tomato in her recipe. I don't know. It's very, but you need both, right? You need the growing and the cooking. And that's amazing what Kitazawa is doing. So can you share a little bit more about how you came to Kitazawa, the different things that you've done and what Kitazawa is doing to help multiple, I mean, thousands of people have this experience? Yeah. I mean, I love your story. And I think that your story is so representative of, you know, immigrant experiences from your Italian immigrant family to more recent immigrants to the United States and also from Africa. And people on slave ships were also weaving seeds into their hair. And, you know, the immigrant experiences of of people sowing seeds into their clothing. I actually I hear a lot of similar stories to that. And I just think they're so beautiful. And, you know, we actually reminds me, I had one customer call us a few years ago and their grandfather had passed away, but they had found this cache of seeds uh, in their grandfather's belongings that a lot of them had come directly from Japan and, you know, were written in little slips of paper in Japanese and wanted actually us to help translate some of the, what they were. But, you know, it's just such a beautiful, it's just such a beautiful way of being able to really connect with your family heritage and feel really close to the people that have come before you. And so I, I just love your, I love your story. In terms of, you know, the work that Kitazawa is doing, you know, this history of Kitazawa is it was started by two brothers and um, in 1917. And it is, you know, the oldest Asian seed company in the United States, specializing in Asian varieties. And the brothers were selling vegetable seeds to Japanese farmers in California, and then also providing, you know, for basically their home garden seeds from that were traditional Japanese vegetables that the farmers were mostly just using for their home use for their families and and for their community while they were growing these other more commercially viable vegetables. And so that tradition continued. The company was not able to actually continue through the internment. So it um, paused for a couple of years. But once the internment was over, the company restarted again. And since then, it has really flourished. It has continued this tradition of selling both to commercial farmers and to the home gardener. And I think that that's one thing that is really beautiful about Kitazawa is that we are always listening and hearing from our customers about what is important to them and trying to do our best to be able to bring in seeds that, you know, are otherwise inaccessible. So it starts as a company that really focuses mostly on the Japanese American vegetables or Japanese vegetables. And because that was primarily the customer base, but as you know, waves of immigration from Asia came to the United States, we've had different demand for different other kinds of Asian vegetables. And so it's been a joy to be able to expand our offerings 
to be able to provide vegetables for lots of different communities. And so it's one of the things I think that we want to be able to focus on also is that we still provide lots of hybrids they are very reliable, um, but we also provide and really value open pollinated varieties. And these are varieties that people can in their tradition save seeds and grow them year after year, which, you know, is a wonderful, I mean, it's really important, I think, in terms of seed diversity and preserving preserving seed diversity. But it also means that when I'm growing tomatoes, for example, um, or squash or cucumbers, but let's say maybe squash. If I grow an open pollinated variety of squash in California, and my father grows that same variety of open pollinated squash in New York, and we continue to save seeds year after year, those seeds will adapt to the microclimates that we're each in. It's still the same variety, but the certain traits will sort of emerge in terms of being the best seed for that region. And I think that that is also an immigrant experience as well, is that you bring the seeds with you, but the seeds also take on your new home. And they're sort of a, a reflection of the of your immigration experience as well, in terms of that you have the variety from your homeland. And then it takes on the soil and the air and the sunshine and all of that from from your this new place and you know as it as it thrives it continues to change and, and evolve just just like you know your kind of experience in your new home so i actually really love the i love that we do really value these open pollinated varieties and you know, I think there's a small portion of our community that probably is saving the seeds. You know, as home gardeners, we don't think about that so much as saving seed, but it's something that I think as people get more experienced in um, in gardening and even beginners, there's certain varieties that are very easy to save seeds. You know, you can you can do it after your first year. It's something that is very rewarding also and would highly encourage people to do. That is so beautiful viewing the experience of an heirloom seed going from iteration to iteration of itself and having that be a reflection of the first, second generation, like all of the different generations of an immigrant family, like that brings tears to my eyes. That is so beautiful. Oh my gosh. I want to like soak that in for a minute. Yeah. It's interesting hearing your story of how Kitazawa has broadened, you know, it's, it's supply. What is the process look like for you guys for bringing in a new variety of seed? How do you even source them and multiply them and bring them to market? Yeah, a lot of our seeds are still imported from Asia. And so we have been working with a lot of the same growers for decades and are very reliable. There is, I think, some more plans in place to really think about more domestic production. I think that with all of the issues around supply chain issues of shipping as, as in the times we are in, it's definitely more of a, of a question that we need to consider. And I think for a lot of reasons that actually trying to think about domestic production is a good idea. There are amazing people doing small batch seed production in the United States doing really incredible work. Um, One of the people that is doing fabulous work is Kristen Leach of Second Generation Seeds, who is a Korean American farmer and, you know, has several land race seed varieties that are really just fabulous and amazing. So there are really, there are great projects of seed production in the United States doing work that's not, you know, Asian American seeds, but seeds for communities of color. But a lot of our seeds are still brought in from from Asia. And, you know, I think part of it is we just need a larger amount than small farmers can really uh, supply at this point. But, you know, a lot of the times it comes from 
customer suggestions. So we still love to hear from our customers and have conversations with customers about, you know, what is something that they want to see us carry. One of our new varieties this year is a Filipino eggplant. And we have been asked for many, many, many years to carry a Filipino eggplant where, you know, we have lots of varieties of Japanese eggplant. We have many varieties of Chinese eggplant. And we kept hearing that none of them were quite right. You know, of of course, you can make a dish with a Chinese eggplant, but it's just not quite the same. And, you know, so it was a process of us getting educated about the differences um, between a Filipino eggplant and a Chinese eggplant. And, you know, trying to find a good source. And that can actually take quite a long time. When we bring in seeds, we have to think about, you know, not just getting a particular variety, but they need to have a certain amount of quality. We need to make sure that they're, you know, that they have good vigor, that they are going to be able to grow well. Um, We want to make sure that what we're offering is our quality seeds. We like to also try them out first. So it can take actually several years for us to not only just source a seed, but also to just ensure that all the the quality pieces are met. So we are really excited this year that we are now finally offering a Filipino eggplant, which has been, you know, something that was 100% initiated by our customers. And then sometimes, you know, it's initiated by staff. So when I came on staff at Kitazawa, we actually didn't have a huge amount of Korean seeds. But in the years that I've been there, we've actually been able to really increase the offerings of the different varieties of Korean peppers and some other Korean varieties, some herbs and other things. So, you know, it could be, you know, initiated by staff, but most of the time, actually, it's largely driven by our customer base of asking for specific varieties um, for us to bring them in. And I think one of the things that I like to remember is that our customers are mostly the experts and I'm here in service of them. So, you know, I really love to have these conversations with our customers about their childhood memories, about a particular vegetable that they are trying to find because they have a particular memory with family member, a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle or their parents. And so I love to learn about that. I I do think of our customers as being the experts. You know, sometimes people call Kitazawa with questions and, you know, they want germination information and all of that kind of stuff. I'm happy to help with that. But really, when it comes to what vegetables are important for us to carry, our customers are 100% the experts on that. Thank you to today's episode sponsors, Espoma Organic and Territorial Seed Company. Espoma Organic is a family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. We're in gardening season, plant friends. How exciting. And everything that you need from high-quality seed starting mix and potting mixes to garden soil and compost and fertilizer. And Espoma has your back with everything you need to get your garden growing from high-quality seed starting mix to potting mixes to garden soil to compost to fertilizers and more. And if it's your houseplants that you're prepping for, because we're entering the growing season for houseplants as well, they've got houseplant-specific potting mixes for cacti, African violets, orchids, and even bonsai mix. So whatever plants you're growing, they've got the growing media for you. I am personally counting down the days to our last frost season so I can plant some grow bags on my balcony and I will be using their Biotone Starter Plus Starter Fertilizer, which is a fertilizer you put in when you plant your plants. I'm going to plant them in the standard Espoma potting mix and then I'm going to be following up with the Garden Tone Fertilizer throughout the growing season. And obviously I'll be using the Tomato Tone on my tomatoes to keep them happy and juicy. To top it all off, Espoma has a huge sustainability commitment with 100% solar-powered plant, zero-waste manufacturing, and eco-friendly packaging. To learn more about the indoor and outdoor products Espoma has to offer, visit espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or click the link below in the show notes to my Espoma Amazon storefront with a collection of my favorite picks to order them online. 
Thank you to Territorial Seed Company for sponsoring today's episode. Plant friends, it is not too late to get your spring vegetable garden started. There are a ton of varieties ready to be seeded into your garden right now, including beans, cucumbers, corn, pumpkin, squash, and more. If you want the highest quality seeds guaranteed to perform in your garden, sow Territorial Seed. We know I love them. I used Territorial Seed for my garden and Melody's garden last summer. Right now, I am personally hyper fixated on planting some wildflowers on our lawn on our property this year, and I'll be doing that with Territorial Seed. They have a bunch of different wildflower mixes and pollinator mixes. I also love that every seed variety is extensively trialed and tested at their 80-acre organic farm, and their testing process really ensures that you can trust their seeds for your garden. It's also not too early to pre-order your garlic for overwintering in your garden. So with garlic, you sow it in the fall and then you harvest in the spring. And once you order, it will be shipped to you at the perfect time to plant, September through October, but they sell out because they have amazing garlic. So order now. Whether it's seeds, plants, garden planters, or more, Territorial Seed can set you up for success when it comes to your 2022 garden this year. They have an exclusive coupon code for Bloom and Grow Radio listeners. Visit TerritorialSeed.com and use code GROW10 at checkout. That's GROW10 at checkout at TerritorialSeed.com. So I've got to ask some more follow-up questions on the eggplant. What are the differences between Japanese, Chinese, and Filipino eggplant? Yes, uh, good question. I think, you know, traditionally people think of a Japanese eggplant as being pretty long and narrow and purple. There are some exceptions to this, of course. But generally, the Japanese eggplants are are long, narrow, purple, and they have a per- what they call as a purple calyx. And the calyx is the part of the eggplant that attaches to the stem. And the Chinese eggplants often have a green calyx and are often lighter in color than the Japanese eggplants. And the Filipino eggplant, I think, is often sort of, well, the one we're bringing in is sort of a a greenish purple eggplant. It's not a hundred percent purple, um, which is it's really quite beautiful. It also has sort of a a green and purple calyx, um, kind of kind of a mix. But I think a lot of it has to do with not just appearance, but it also has to do with some flavor and some texture as well. I think of the the Japanese eggplants as generally being quite firm, and they're often used for pickles. And so because of that, you want sort of this very firm eggplant, very low moisture content. And the Chinese eggplants I think of are being as a bit creamier. So I personally, unfortunately, am allergic to eggplant. So that nightshade allergy, you got the nightshade just allergy? Just the eggplant. Um, and oh, I okay. developed it later in life. So I haven't been able to actually taste the Filipino eggplant because of my allergy. <laughs> but I do think they're really beautiful. Um, they're really, really quite beautiful. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing feedback about, about the eggplants that we've brought in. And what was for the specific, the Filipino eggplant, you mentioned that this is a multi-year process. So what was the, what, how many years did it take to bring that to market? Um, well, let's see, I've been working at Kitazawa for four years and we had been getting requests ever since I had started there. So I think we seriously started looking around maybe three years ago, pre-pandemic to bring in the, bring in the seed. That's amazing. Congratulations. You've mentioned that you've heard story over after story about connecting with your customers and what these seeds have meant to them. Can you share some other stories, some other customer wins? I feel like we we hear them every day. One of the things that is really amazing is we have an incredibly loyal um, customer base. And so we actually still get letters in the mail <laughs> that people send Aww. us and, and orders in the mail. Um, and it's, it's really quite lovely. But, you know, one thing that happened recently was that we got a request for some Okinawan bitter gourd. And bitter gourd has really just exploded in popularity over the last um, couple of years. And especially this past year, we really just saw um, an incredible increase in demand. It's a, a, for kind of a 
variety of a vegetable that um, is really quite bitter and I think, you know, takes some amount of, um, if you're not used to really eating very bitter vegetables, it takes some amount of getting used to. I, I personally love it. But, you know, we sold out of it last year, which I, I was like, how is this possible that this really bitter vegetable we're selling out of? But it was an interesting kind of circling back to what it means about, you know, coming from a particular place. Because, you know, I was a bit puzzled by the request for Okinawan eggplant. And I was kind of hitting some dead ends about, you know, sourcing Okinawan bitter melon. And trying to figure out, you know, really what is the distinction and not getting a lot of great answers, kind of coming up short in a lot of my research, even with talking to some of our our seed suppliers and our growers, and just not really being able to figure it out very well. And coincidentally, I was talking to one of our customers about another unrelated vegetable, and she is from Okinawa. Her mother is 100% Okinawan. And we kind of by chance started talking about this bitter melon dish that her mother has made. And, you know, she offered to share the recipe with us. And I was just sort of thrilled. So I, you know, asked her about, you know, what does Okinawan bitter melon mean? to you. What is the difference between that and Japanese bitter melon? And it was so amazing to have her tell me that, you know, the bitter melon itself is essentially the same. But what makes it different is that the place that it's grown in. So the special soil and the special environment and the special climate that Okinawa has versus Japan is really what makes Okinawan bitter melon Okinawan bitter melon and makes it special. And to me, that just really was so incredible because it does make me, it really does remind me that where you are matters, that the place that you are in really matters. And her mother make can make this you know, Okinawan recipe, this bitter gourd recipe, and she makes it in the United States. It still tastes like home, even though she's using bitter melon that's grown, you know, in her backyard in California. So it's just a really beautiful, I think, reminder of where we come from and and where we are currently and just that whole circle that we had talked about earlier. So it's just really um, was a wonderful kind of moment with a customer to be able to share that experience and also that she also freely shared this recipe from her from her family which is a family recipe so it was just very generous we have a lot of customers who are just very generous with us that way you have the recipes on your website uh, I am going to be posting that recipe on our website she did give us permission so it will be on our website um, coming up that's amazing. I'm not very familiar with bitter melon. How is it prepared normally? Yeah, there's a very famous Chinese preparation that is bitter melon and egg, oftentimes with sausage or with pork. Um, and that is a very, very famous preparation. It's really quite delicious. We have a friend who made for me one year, not for me specifically, but for a gathering a raw bitter melon salad and she's Filipino. And this was maybe the, my favorite preparation of bitter melon that I'd ever had. She had salted or brined the bitter melon, which drew out a lot of the bitterness, but it was still, you know, kind of faintly bitter. So it still tasted like bitter melon, but it really had the texture of a cucumber. It was just so fresh and crunchy and just really fabulously delicious. She had it with a, there was a dressing on it and it just was incredible. And so people will uh, slice it and dry it for tea as a bitter melon tea. And then the braised bitter melon is also a very famous Indian preparation and which is also really delicious. It becomes very smooth and silky and just really wonderful that way as well. So I think there's a lot of different ways to prepare bitter melon. And I am still 
working my way through a lot of them. But most of the ones that I guess right now, my favorite one is the bitter melon salad that was raw. And I, I think that that is, you know, if you had told me maybe 20 years ago that I would be eating raw bitter melon and, and loving it, I would not have believed you. But it really is. Uh, it's a it's really really great. I think part of the popularity of bitter melon recently has been that they have kind of found a lot of health benefits. I think because it's a bitter food, it's actually quite good for you. And so I think a lot of people are kind of discovering bitter melon for its health properties and, and enjoying it. Oh, that's so interesting. I would buy a Kitazawa cookbook in a heartbeat. <laughs> How cool would that be to profile the different seeds and then have the international recipes? That's a wonderful idea. We've always, in our catalogs, we've had a, a small section of recipes. A lot of them were family recipes from um, the previous owners, Maya and Jim, who took a lot of the recipes from both of their families, and then some cu- recipes from customers and other partners. But it was really always like pretty small. And so I think it would be a really fun project. I, I would agree for an actual cookbook to come out. I would love that. Yeah. Who do I give my credit card to? I'm yeah. ready. That would be amazing. And I could see like gorgeous photography. It could almost be like a coffee table book of showing how, you know, the growth process and, and the different dishes. I'm here for it. I love it. I love it. We need a project manager. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just finished my first book writing process. So I'll, I'll help you out. I'll, okay. I'll give you, awesome. Give we'll you a take, push. We'll yeah. have to take you up on that. Yeah, for sure. So what about some of your favorite varieties? So say I'm, I'm so excited for this episode for people to connect of our listeners of Asian American, you know, heritage, but say people might want to try one of your varieties from Kitazawa, like, where would you suggest we start? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the great things about Asian vegetables is there's just such a huge diversity. So there's literally something for everyone from the beginning gardener to, you know, the more experienced gardener and everything in between um, from, you know, if you're growing on a farm on 50 acres or you just have a little backyard patio or a balcony or even just a window. So there really is, you know, something for everyone. I think for people who are just starting out and one of the things that's really easy to get started are Asian herbs. So there are a huge variety of Asian herbs from bunching onions that you can use in pretty much everything. They're really easy to grow and those are those are really simple to you know some chinese leeks which are a little bit less simple to grow and then you know thai basil and all of the different kinds of perilla there really is just a a great variety of asian herbs to um to get started with super easy pretty fail safe and talk about the scents too i mean i'm really into scented plants right now that Asian herb garden would have some amazing scents. Exactly. It's it's really, really wonderful. And it just adds a tons of flavor to, to your cooking. I think we actually have an Asian herb sort of collection of things on our website. But that's one thing that I would recommend to get started is checking out the Asian herbs. And, you know, I think for... Some of our more experienced gardeners, you know, you can actually go with the gourds, which are, there's a lot of different varieties of gourds, not just the bitter melon, but the bottle gourds and the wax gourds. Uh, We have a lot of, and a lot of different kinds of gourds. Gourds are definitely a little bit more tricky, but if someone is up for the challenge, they are really fun and wonderful. If, If you have the ability to trellis them, you can make these just, they have They put out lots of foliage and you can trellis them to be able to pick them easily. And they are just also just a really fun thing to grow. They do require quite a bit of, they require a bit more space and they also require 
a long, warm growing season. So that can be a little bit tricky, but, you know, we have some tips for people to be able to grow them even in northern climates. And then there's the ones that I think are kind of what I would consider big payoff varieties. So you have things like your peas, which can be, you can eat the shoots, but, you know, and you can have like the snow peas, the snap peas. They're also pretty easy to grow and pretty straightforward and you kind of get a lot of vegetables for your effort. And then, you know, of course, the tomatoes and the cucumbers and the peppers are very much like your regular summertime vegetables that, you know, I think are kind of mean summer, but um, are so versatile and you can really and really do a lot with them. And our, you know, Asian peppers, again, there's just a lot of different varieties. So you can go from something that just doesn't have a lot of heat to something that's really quite spicy and that you can have sort of a, a range of things depending on what your spice level is. Yeah. And, you know, if you want something that our Japanese cucumbers are really, really wonderful. And they're also really actually fairly easy to grow. They need a trellis as well, right? Yeah. They will. They're, yes, they benefit from, they benefit from some space. Um, And especially because they're long, you want to have them be able to have enough space to actually grow long and narrow, but they still taste just as good if they're, they curl up a little bit, you know, they're just harder to deal with. But yeah, so, you know, we have so many things that I feel like can really be suitable for whatever your particular needs are. And we're always happy to give rep- recommendations. So, you know, f- from someone wants to just give us a call, we'd be happy to help figure that out for them. Amazing. So you mentioned you're in an apartment, but you're growing. So what does your current setup look like? What's your favorite thing to grow these days? And what's your favorite recipe to cook with it? Yeah, I think that my favorite thing of all time to grow is, I mean, this is really very hard to decide, but I think that for me, Korean perilla is, it's an Asian or it's a Korean herb, but it is singularly the one vegetable that I have maybe the longest relationship with, you know, I think it is, it is just a very meaningful plant to me personally. So I always like to have that. And what I actually do with it is I do two things. One, I use it as basically kind of a lettuce wrap. That's how a lot of people use it. And also I pickle it as well. And um, it's really wonderful as a pickle or as a kimchi. So I think that if you grow any of the perilla varieties, we have a Japanese shiso, we have a Vietnamese variety, and then a Korean variety. They're very easy to grow. They will naturalize actually in some parts of the country. So you, you know, may want to think about that if you have a place where they might spread. Sometimes we have perilla popping up in funny places, but it is a hands down, maybe a variety that I can't ever imagine not having. So can you grow it in a container? You absolutely can grow it in a container. So, okay. Yeah. I've got to do containers this year, but uh, maybe I'll try Perilla for the first time. I've never, I don't, I don't think I've ever tried it before. Oh, it's, it's, I think you're going to love it. And yeah, you can chop it up, you know, you can kind of slice it very finely or, you know, I've made a pesto out of it also, which, uh, you know, one year um, we had a just had access to a lot of it. And so I made it, I was making pesto all summer long and um, Mm. it was, and I was just putting it on pasta. I mean, it was really, really wonderful. Oh, that sounds amazing. We have one plant from my grandma's garden still that my mom has cultivated. My grandma sage that she brought over from oh, Italy. Wow. So I'm going to try and propagate it. I almost killed it this year because I moved too many times. Uh, but if I can successfully propagate it, maybe I'll send you some of my grandma sage this summer. And, that would uh, be so amazing. I would love that. Yeah, and I'll try. I'll try growing perilla so we can trade. Yeah. Trade our, um, our heritages. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll send you a packet of, I'll send you a packet of the Perilla seeds and you can, um, give it a shot. 
Oh, I'm so excited. That would be amazing. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. I didn't kill this plant this winter in New York, but I think, I think it's going to come back. She's going to come back in it. I know. I know she'll make it happen for me. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, that seems like such a precious plant. And I think you have, sounds like you've come a long way on your plant journey. And so um, I, I have faith in you that you can bring it back. (laughs) Totally, totally. And, and learn about, you know, other, other cultures as well through trying to grow up. We, Billy and I, we moved someplace where there's no good Asian restaurants. So we've really gotten into cooking. We've been learning a lot about cooking Asian food these days, but I haven't really been growing it as I haven't grown as much of it as I'd want to. So that's, I'm, I'm very inspired by this conversation. Yeah. Well, another thing that I didn't mention in terms of vegetables are we have a huge number of pak choy available and pak choy can also be grown in a container. So it doesn't actually take that much space. You can grow, we have a bunch of varieties that are really small that would be really appropriate for growing in a container. And it's pretty hardy variety so that you can grow them in the fall and, or, you know, there's a lot of them you can kind of grow year round in some places. So that would be another great starter variety. It's a, it's very hearty vegetable and the seeds are pretty easy to deal with as well. And yeah, great for containers. Isn't it one of the most nutritious plants ever? I think it's one of also the highest nutrient value or concentration. Oh, really? Well, that, that would be wonderful. (laughs) I should, I should eat more of it. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, thank you so much. These stories have been so inspiring and you're very inspiring. I can't wait to order off of Kitazawa's seed. Well, we'll see this year or next year, whichever year I'm allowed to grow again, because I might be moving again this summer, but I'm so excited to order off of your catalog. Where can everyone find you if they're feeling seen by this episode or feeling inspired by this episode and, and inspired to grow some of your varieties? Yeah, absolutely. So our website is kitazawaseed.com. So K-I-T-A-Z-A-W-A-S-E-E-D.com. And we have a new website this year. So I think it, ordering off of our website has become really quite simple and um, but also just feel free to email us at seeds at kidazawaseed.com and we are happy to always answer any questions and always open to suggestions as well so we'd love to hear what people what would like to see us carry Um, we do have plans to continue to expand our scope of of varieties that we offer so we're always happy to hear from from people and and hear people's suggestions about what we should be carrying. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for for sharing with us today and uh, can't wait to keep growing with you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to YC for the special conversation. I was so touched at their open heart and stories. This was so beautiful. Man, seeds are so emotional. Plants are so emotional. Uh, My grandma Sage is slowly coming back to life. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it handled the winter uh, and I'm hoping to propagate it soon and hopefully get to share some of my my culture and my, my personal heritage with YC. If you are interested in any of the seeds or plants that we discussed today, you can visit kitazawaseed.com to check out their amazing varieties that they have and everything for Kitazawa will also be linked in the show notes. Inspired by this episode, I hope you can maybe take a few minutes and sit and think about a plant or a gardening moment that connected you to someone special in your life because that's what this is all about, right? All right, plant friends, I hope you have a beautiful week and until next time, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show on your preferred podcast player so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, if you wouldn't mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review, that would be tremendous. Reviews are so helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thank you so much in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Bloom and Grow content, we have so many fun options for you that I want to tell you about. First off, there is the free Bloom and Grow plant parent personality test. 
It's free, it's super fun, and it only takes three minutes to complete. You take the test and you get your plant parent personality profile. And with that, you get a list of your strengths and weaknesses as a plant parent. And most importantly, my curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are perfectly suited for you and your planty interests based on your results. The test lives at bloomandgrowradio.com slash personality and can always be found in the show notes of this episode. Okay, plant friends, here's the really good stuff. If you are looking to really grow and up-level your plant parent skills this year, I cordially and proudly invite you to join the Bloom and Grow Virtual Garden Society, rooted in high-quality education and plant community. Plant friends, this is not your grandma's garden society. It's virtual and therefore connects you with plant friends around the world, accessed via our proprietary garden party platform and app, and has the best educational and community-based content and resources available to anyone. When you join, you get immediate access to the entire Bloom and Grow Garden Party platform and app, which is our exclusive space off social media, algorithm free, troll free, with tons of amazing ways to meet other plant parents like you, like regional groups, daily conversation prompts, and even a plant swap space, which is pretty cool. And in addition to that, you get all of the exclusive premium society content, which is three monthly live calls with myself and our horticulturist in residence and beloved Bloom and Grow Radio guest, Leslie Halleck all in the interest of helping you grow. Leslie hosts monthly Node of Knowledge plant science lectures and monthly office hours, which we call AHAs or Ask Our Horticulturist Anythings, where you can troubleshoot your personal plant collection problems with her. Think about that. You have access to a horticulturist to troubleshoot your personal plant care issues. So amazing. And then I host monthly Growing Joy calls for community development and to explore the plant care, self-care aspect of plant parenthood. Plus, when you join, you not only get access to the upcoming live calls, but you get full access to all of the replays of previous calls and lectures, like The Science of Plant Dormancy or Grow Lights 101 and beyond. So you can binge your way to your best year yet of plant parenthood. Please come join us. We're having so much fun. Learn more by clicking the link in the show notes or visiting jointhegardensociety.com. For anything else, plant friend, I'm here for you. Feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, follow me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and behind the scenes podcast content. Thank you again for listening to Bloom and Grow Radio. It is my true honor and delight to always help you keep blooming and keep growing. plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hot 
take plant friends, there is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm. 